Hey guys, Space Marine 658 here, and I am here to bring you something a little bit different. Um, I have been off for a little bit. I've been busy with the full-time job as well as raising a child at the same time as a stay-at-home dad. Uh, that's kind of been a little difficult, but you know, things are progressing. He's getting older. It's getting a little easier as I kind of get used to the flow of work and raising him at the same time. So with that, I want to kind of bring you in on what I've been working on, as well as maybe offer some insight for some indie developers out there, some suggestions maybe. So here I've been working on my own games, um, sort of schema for the AI, um, and it's kind of complicated, uh, but we can talk about, you know, when it's applicable to do something like that and when it's not. Um, so let's jump right into it. So the big thing you're going to want to consider when you are creating your game's AI is going to be the, the game itself. So the genre, the target audience, all those kind of things factor into it. For example, in a tower defense game, you don't necessarily need the smartest AI. Um, in fact, with how many AI die, I, I don't know that it necessarily makes that big a difference. Now there are some cases when you can kind of you know break the rules um, if you understand what they are and do something a little bit cool with that. So for example, I've seen some tower defense games that actually allow the AI to um, update on the fly. So you can change the layout of the map and the AI will adjust to that um, versus being lock stepped and locked into place. So there are ways to break the rules, but for the most part with a game like that, you're gonna wanna stick pretty straight to it. Um, but some games, especially open world games, or at least open, enough games um, can allow for some really, really cool interactions with AI. For example, um, one of the more recent examples I like to give people is Ready or Not. It is a shooter and it is not what I would consider an open world game. Now, yes, you can go anywhere you want within the levels, but they're very limited size um, compared to something like an open world game. Yet, they recently had an update where they gave so much life to AI. You know, AI will use the restroom, AI will hide and cover. Um, AI will sometimes be chickens and just chicken out. And that adds so much depth and complexity to a game that's in a genre that, you know, really hasn't evolved much in a lot of years. Not to say that shooters are bad. I, I love shooters just as much as the next guy, but they don't feel like they're moving as quickly as many other genres. So with this, that's something that I wanted to carry over into my own game was more than just this you know, simple point A, point B, occasionally fighting AI system. I wanted something that was living, breathing, and feels complex. Well, to get that, it's kind of difficult. You really have to think about what your AI is going to want to do, what they're going to be doing. So with that, I've spent some time planning that out. Now, I've done a little scripting here and there, but Unreal Engine, I'm still kind of grasping the full scale of behavior trees. Um, so I'm trying to make sure that, you know, I understand them fully before I dive into them, especially because I want to make sure I optimize them as I go along. Now, optimization, you usually want to save for the end, but I think with something as complex as a behavior tree, it's okay to optimize a little bit at the beginning. For example, bit masks. There's going to be probably a lot of booleans in my behavior tree, considering how complex I want my AI to be. So learning bit masking early on is going to help me sort of focus and hone in those booleans so that I'm not passing back and forth huge chunks of data that's just getting passed around. Um, that's just sluggish, slow, and it's gonna cause a lot of problems. So let's kind of dive in specifically to my game, um, but this is gonna kind of help me provide some more generalized advice. So for example, um, even just this section alone could be useful. So this is sort of a um, style sheet that is, is a flow chart, I guess is a better way of putting it, um, to how my AI is going to work, you know, how decisions are made in the game. Uh, I'm using Lucidchart. You can use tons of other programs. You can use Microsoft Paint if you want to. Um, there's no particular best practice. There's just what people prefer. Um, I like this one because it's free. I mean, you can go out and get it free and it's got a lot of handy tools. Now, some of the tools are locked behind the paywall. I'm not sure the exact breakdown. Um, but you can look into it if you like. But anyways, back to the planning here. So what I started off with, I knew that I wanted to have there to be a structure. 
it's it's a game set in naval space combat so there's got to be some sort of organizational structure so i took a moment and researched a lot of naval structure in in history like how do real navies handle you know day-to-day ship maintenance but also combat and so i built my ai kind of from the top down that way so i started out with the fleet admiral um, they are basically the top dog. They're basically one short stop of the leader of whatever country you're part of. Um, they're like your five-star general equivalent. Um, some may have multiple, but usually there's one or at least a couple. And then from there, they actually make decisions that are sort of broad generalized strokes. So they might say, um, we need to make, you know, strategic plays in this area. So they might decide, you know, this zone. Um, So I wanted to kind of, you know, have that uh, exemplified here in the game. So their decision making is more simple, um, but it kind of, you know, relies on the outcome of all of the combat and everything that's going on. So they will take in sort of a slower tick. um, But let's say, you know, for example, um, to use Unreal Engine terms, Um, because that's what I'm programming in, but you can be programming this in Unity. Um, I have it set to probably some kind of timer, um, event by timer, where the fleet admiral will make a decision. So, you know, combat's going and going, and things are going just okay. Not great, not poorly. Then they'll just allocate resources. So they'll provide the rear admirals um, and vice admirals the materials they need to continue operations. Um, let's say things are going really poorly, but specifically they're going poorly because of bad decisions made by leadership. So um, let's say a rear admiral makes a decision that is a blunder and ends up getting them um, really bad negative reputation. That's something that I kind of it's am generalizing here, um, but I'm going to be more specific when it comes to the coding. Specifically, this is mostly going to be if the player is able to get the drop on an enemy Um, or hit targets they shouldn't be able to hit, say, like stations that are supposed to be safe. Uh, This is going to make the Fleet Admiral more inclined to lead towards, you know, either withdrawal or increase of forces, depending on how bad it's going, um, how, you know, advantageous that area is. So, for example, if there's an area that provides access to fuel for their ships, um, they're less likely to withdraw from that area because they want to protect that area that is that is a valuable resource, so he's probably going to increase the forces, um, which means taking those forces away from somewhere else. So that fleet admiral isn't going to just spawn those ships out of nowhere. Instead, there's going to be a pool of, of ships, you know, controlled by these rear admirals and vice admirals, and he may take some from one area to another. And as you can see there, that already leads to possibly some gameplay, gameplay implications. The player could do a sneak attack on an enemy station where he doesn't actually want to take over that area, but more of just wants to draw enemy forces away from somewhere he does want to attack and take. So the enemy ends up taking a lot of forces away from there, and eventually the player goes over and takes that area, and boom, players got what they wanted. Now, it's not to say player couldn't just keep attacking the built-up forces and whittling them down, um, but it leaves the option open for the player to make these kind of strategic choices. And I think that is where designing your AI with even just simple interactions like that makes all the difference. Um, So let's move on and talk about uh, what happens next. So, you know, after they've made their decision based on the current outcomes, you end up getting these rear admirals that then make their own decisions. So um, you have rear admirals, which are the upper half of rear admirals, and you have vice admirals. So they're both usually pretty equivalent ranking. Some Sometimes rear admirals are higher, sometimes vice admirals are higher, it depends on the country itself. Um, but they make decisions that are a little bit more localized. So in the previous example, we talked about how they might the, the fleet admiral will take resources from one area to another. That would be equivalent of them taking a rear admiral from one location and moving them to another location with another rear admiral. And then that rear admiral then has these decisions that they would make in that regional location. Now, when it comes to decision making with multiple rear admirals, that is going to come down to more of a um, 
sort of the AI is going to have to communicate to each other. Now, my initial plan was maybe some kind of vote, but that feels sort of um, averaging, uh, which you could totally do and definitely you could get away with. Um, I think for me, it's going to be more based on that individual admiral's prestige. So, for example, if you have an admiral that continually loses battles against the player, they are going to have less prestige than somebody who wins a lot of battles, so either against the player or against other forces. And so you'll end up with an admiral that has a lot more prestige, has a lot more power. So he could come in, say he gets pulled over by the the admiral from one from one sector to another, and then suddenly he's calling the shots. So he's leading the charge. He's saying, no, don't do this. We're going to do this. And that's where these decision-making sort of pieces happen. So the decisions for that specific group are going to be made more on the regional strategic and tactical decisions. So, you know, where do we defend? Where do we attack um, within that region? They also handle local logistics. So, you know, getting ammo, fuel, forces to and from the battlefield. And then they also handle planning um, using, you know, rear admirals and vice admirals usually help each other. Um, so, you know, whoever leads and makes the decisions, they'll have the other admirals backing up their planning. Um, they'll have like a planning boost. And so the benefit of a system like this, especially the way I'm planning to have it, um, and having these sort of decisions made by a specific you know individual allows um, for more of a personalization of the enemy instead of having this anonymous enemy ship captain um, you can have them have actual names and have it sort of lead to this situation where you know a, a commander a rear admiral maybe has a personality that leads them to charge more often they're more likely to try and ram the player's ship as an example the player will get to recognize you know maybe their banner their banner is very specific so the player just recognizes that and instantly knows they're gonna try to ram me they're a lot braver but also means they're a lot more make likely to make mistakes when it comes to an ambush the player might set up so the player may set a bunch of mines and then hide them strategically throughout a asteroid zone for example and then come in, fly by that that admiral at high speed, and, and you know shoot at him to to make him angry, make him upset, make him chase him, and then fly right through the asteroid, and then boom, blow him up, and either destroy him or at least severely damage him. And this again feeds into that loop of player decisions, player player led feedback. And I think this is this is the big crux of all AI is allowing your players to make those sort of decisions and have their impacts actually matter. Have them be reasonable um, and well thought out, but making sure that they also fit within the context of your game. Now, this is a very complex tree. And this is just literally the top two sectors I'm talking about here. Um, and you can already see how complex it gets further down as it goes. And that's kind of on you at that point. Um, in your game, you need to make that decision. Do I want something that's really complex, that is likely to be not as performant, but maybe is more interesting? Um, or is it more interesting? You know, you may be making a game where that would actually be the more boring option. You know, maybe there's an option that um, that allows your world to live a little better, live, breathe a little more. Um, and that's something you really have to consider is these are not one-stop shop fixes You know, you can't just copy paste what I have put here into your game and make it work um, Because all games are different you know, even games in the same genre can be wildly different. I mean look at No Man's Sky um, Versus something like Eve Online. They're both space games in the space genre and they both have elements of like strategy and crafting but they're vastly different. I don't think anyone ever compare them to being the same game. There might be elements within them for a star stylistically art choice you might compare and be like, you like one way or another. But when it comes to true gameplay, they're completely different and you couldn't really compare them, especially now with AI. So yeah, um, I think that's the main talking points. Um, I'm probably gonna make a separate video to actually go through the rest of this and actually talk about as it pertains to my game, but I wanted to give a talk about sort of overall, you know, indie development, how I believe AI, you know, 
design should work, how you should think about AI, rather than thinking about it like a obstacle that your game has to have, like, oh, you know, I have to create AI. It should be a, a willful design choice that you make, whether it's very simplistic or very complex. That's a choice you have to make and something that you should make, for lack of a better word, stylistically. This should some, be something that plays into your game style and plays into your game. Um, feed into that feedback loop of player-led feedback. So yeah. But I think that is it for today. Um, if you have any questions, leave them down below. Make sure to like it. It helps with the YouTube algorithm. But otherwise, good luck. Good hunting.